Hi, I'm Jan Kleiner, the Research Director of ESI, a division of MKF, and today I'd like to talk a little about the idea of intra-pulse beam steering. So we'll start out with a little introduction about the, the evolution over time of high bandwidth beam positioning development that has become ever more important and places become ever more powerful. And I'll give you a little uh, peek into uh, industrial level laser material interaction modeling that we do here and that enables us to, to gain some insights that come in handy every now and then. And then we'll put those two things together and uh, look at this idea of intrapulse beam steering to enable a faster uh, via drilling for high density interconnect uh, printed circuit boards. So if you look at high bandwidth beam positioning over time, back in the day, certainly well before my time, uh, lasers were so low in power that a simple fixed objective and a stage was sufficient. Uh, the laser process time was so dominant that the stage move time was negligible. So you could just have your little, little party on a stage uh, stack stage and uh, that would move around and you stop where you need to to process what you need to process. The next step you'll all be very familiar with, this is the famous step and repeat process. You have a Galvo scanner uh, and you'll process everything within that scan field and then your linear stage moves from one place to another um, and that uh, creates your combined beam positioning trajectory. Uh, this is very widespread uh, to this day. Um, and uh, very, very popular. Um, but uh, a refinement of that step and repeat process is what is now dubbed the infinite field of view, uh, where uh, you combine the motion of the linear stages and Galvo in parallel by synchronizing, calibrating them to each other. Uh, and our patent has, uh, has recently expired, so now this is becoming much more widespread, and you probably have come across it. Um, the, the key benefit here is that you no longer spend any time on this transitional period uh, from, from one scan field to another, uh, but you can continuously process. Uh, you also don't have any stitching issues because you don't have to fit two scan fields right next to each other perfectly, but your scan field is continuously moving, so if you have continuous features, you can just drag your scan field with you and you never have to stop processing. Uh, you can see here that these are very old videos, so this has been around for, for a very long time. About a decade ago, we introduced the next level of beam positioning by adding a third position uh, method to it, acousto-optic deflectors. And the scan field that they provide is absolutely tiny, but the bandwidth they provide easily goes up to megahertz. And so stacking that on top of the stage and the Galvo hierarchy enables sufficient use of high rep rate, high average power lasers, while mitigating heat accumulation and plume issues for a lot of processes. So here we, we can have a closer look at this. So if you consider this, our, our Galvo scan field here, the pink square, and the blue dots, our vias that we want to drill. And then here we have our tiny little AOD scan field um, that is blown up on the right. And what we see here is that even though the AOD scan field is very, very small, it actually does a lot of work because the Galvos no longer need to move and settle at any specific location, but they can just cruise along into the vicinity of the vias, and then the acoustic optic deflectors provide the last few 10 microns of, of uh, connection to the actual via location and to any micro motion that is necessary to actually carve out uh, our via. And so this uh, enables the use of uh, higher power lasers uh, because the uh, move time from via to via is much faster and uh, the micro motion within the via is, is very easily controlled. Uh, and is not limited by any bandwidth limitations of the, of the gallows. And this is how that looks like in, in real life. All right, so that's the beam positioning aspect. So now let's have a little look into uh, lazy material interaction modeling. And the first question you might ask is, why, why bother? You can actually visualize a lot of these processes today with high-speed uh, cameras, uh, or you can use shear imaging, pump probe, uh, uh, measurements, there's a lot of different ways on how you can try to look closer into your process. So here we have an example of scribing silicon, and over on the right we have a, a series of images for drilling through the top copper layer of a printed circuit board. And while these provide certainly some insights, and combined with the end result of the morphology of your part after you've processed it, uh, can give you a lot of hints as to what's going on, 
uh, we found that actually calculating the interaction from first principles gives us another window into the laser processing world, and it can be surprisingly uh, helpful at times. So how do you go about that? Well, there's, there's a lot of different levels as to how complicated you want things to, to be. Uh, the, the simplest thing that you can do on the back of an envelope is consider the, the thermal diffusion lengths. You get that as the characteristic length scale of the uh, uh, heat diffusion equation. And the nice part about it is that even as disparate materials as copper and glass actually behave you know, with an order of magnitude very similarly. And the diffusion length is, um, uh, if you consider that you know, for micro machining, that's probably on the order of a micron, give or take an order of magnitude. And you can directly see that the associated uh, heating uh, length scales with that are in the order of you know microseconds all the way down to uh, shorter and shorter pulse widths. So that makes intuitive sense just looking at this very simple calculation that micromachining probably has to happen most of the time uh, with uh, with short pulse uh, lasers. Obviously, you know things fall apart here at the at the very short pulse widths of picoseconds and below. Uh, that's beyond the scope of what we want to talk to. Uh, about today. And of course, this is very crude because we're not considering anything about power density, pulse energies, or anything like that. This is a pure time scale uh, argument. So if you want to uh, be a bit more refined, you can actually solve the, the heat diffusion equation. And you can do this with a uh, you know, finite element analysis uh, commercial software fairly straightforwardly. So here we have an example of a UV nanosecond laser with a given spot size and repetition rate carving out a trajectory. And you can make certain assumptions about the behavior of the absorptivity. And then you can create a three-dimensional heat map inside that, that part, as well as the uh, uh, time dependence of that. But often, we don't want to actually heat treat a material, right? We want to actually remove materials. So this, this is not sufficient to, to do that. So you actually have to consider phase transitions. Uh, so here we have an example of uh, processing silicon with a two megahertz laser in the ultra fast regime. And now we can say whenever a voxel hits the, the temperature needed for, for the silicon to melt, we can uh, extract the energy needed for the phase transition. And then once that voxel has enough energy to actually be evaporated, we can remove the associated enthalpy and that voxel and treat it as, as removed. And now we actually get a sense of the amount of material you remove. The black line here indicates the, uh, uh, the melt, melt line. And uh, you, you get a sense of you know, the, the remaining heat that diffuses into your material. And here we have a ultra fast process, so you can add a true temperature model, of course, to that, that calculation. And this is still uh, you know, relatively straightforward to, to be done on a, on a desktop uh, computer. But uh, really, if you want to understand it uh, on a more, more granular level, you have to solve the, the Navier Stokes equations, meaning you have to add hydrodynamics. Uh, to the mix. And so on the left hand side here, we have an LED substrate, which is a gold and aluminum film on a dielectric uh, stack. And you can see here that with each pulse, you, uh, you remove nicely the material in the center and then you create a rim around it. And of course, that's impossible to reproduce just with a thermal model. But once you include the Navier Stokes uh, equations and consider the, the recoil pressure generated by the, by the vapor flow, uh, then you can actually uh, look at you know, the droplet formation as well as this room formation. And that now really provides an insight into how clean a process is and what's going on. Um, now, there's, there's a lot more modeling that, that you can do and that we do, that we do at, at MKS. But uh, for, for today's uh, example, this is actually uh, sufficient uh, to, to get through what we need to do. So you ask yourself, as, OK, so what's the, what's the point? Uh, why go through this uh, effort? And so now let's, let's put it together. Here we have the example of uh, you know, a recent iPhone's uh, high density connect uh, PCB board. And you can see it's, it's chock full of components. And all of these components, of course, need to talk to each other. Uh, and there's no space on the surface for all of those connections to happen. Uh, so if you use a nice saw and you were to just cut straight through, you'd find out that inside there's a very complicated uh, layer of copper wires. And typically, these are 14, 16, even 18 and more layers these days to create the uh, connectivity needed for all of those, those components. And the way these are manufactured is you start out with a core, uh, you have a cop top copper layer on it, you pattern it, and then you laminate the next layer on top of it, you, you pattern that one. And then when you, whenever you want to have a wire go from one level to another level, well, you need to drill a hole and then you plate it. 
And uh, this is done for big holes. This can be done mechanically, but today, for particularly for HDI boards, this is all done with lasers. And the uh, the challenge is actually harder than than you might uh, expect. And the reason for that is that you're trying to get through copper, often you know, 10, 12 microns of copper, uh, and then you have a resin which evaporates very easily, and a glass fiber which doesn't evaporate so easily. And on top of that, of course, you all know that glass is highly transparent, uh, all the way from the near UV through the visible uh, through the near IR. So. Uh, you either need a lot of power to, to cut through these glass fibers, or you need a wavelength that is actually absorbed by, uh, by glass linearly, which is you know, all the way up to the mid -ire. So that's what's typically used, the CO2 laser at 9.3 microns, which has the added benefit that uh, uh, the bottom copper will act as a nice, nice backstrop because most of the power will be reflected uh, by the bottom copper. And so you can create a very nice contrast between the, the dielectric that is being removed by the pulse and the bottom copper not absorbing too much power and delaminating, getting too hot and delaminating from uh, the lower layers. And here's an example of uh, how that looks from, uh, from the side with an SEM picture. That leaves the, the top copper layer as a challenge because there, of course, the mid IR light is also happily reflected. And the key trick there that's been introduced is to add a very thin copper oxide layer on top of it that allows the initial part of the laser pulse to be absorbed and that heats up the copper and warm copper actually absorbs mid IR light reasonably effectively. So here, uh, of course, we can, we can calculate this. So here you have the temperature in the top view and the phase diagram from a side view. And what happens is your laser pulse heats up again the copper oxide and then brings that the copper. And uh, you create a copper milk pool. Um, and uh, you need to get through 12 microns of copper. And if you recall our little chart here of the diffusion lengths, you can look at, well, if I want to go through 10 microns of copper, well, I'll be in the microsecond regime. So there's the simple answer is if you want to drill the hole like this in a single pulse, well, your pulse needs to be on the microsecond uh, pulse width lengths. So you, you have this long pulse and you, you melt the copper and the heat diffuses down and the resin starts to boil because the boiling temperature of the resin is much lower than the melting temperature of the copper. So you create a little gas bubble uh, underneath the copper. And as soon as the melt pool of the copper touches or breaks through to that gas bubble, the gas, which is under high pressure, pushes through that liquid copper and forms the via. So here we have a little animation of that. And that's how these vias are formed. And that's the reason why these vias are drilled so quickly. Um, it's a very efficient process because you actually don't need to worry about evaporating the copper. All you need to, is, to do is create the right kind of melt pool, the right kind of speed to create the right kind of vapor pressure underneath. If the vapor pressure is too low, then the copper is just going to ooze out and you're going to get a large splash zone, which is, which is unacceptable. Um, so here in this example, you know, it takes 10, 20 microseconds to drill through a beer, which of course is, is very fast. And so, and you ask yourself as well, how, you know, how can we do this better? Better, faster, cheaper is the, the name of the game, of course, in, in microelectronics. Uh, and the actual drill time is not the problem, right? That is, that is very fast. So what can we do? Well, uh, I started out with talking about faster beam positioning. So obviously, uh, that helps if you can cut the, the move time from via to via down, you can obviously process faster. And so, uh, yeah, using LEDs for this is a good idea. Done. Uh, moving on, that in and of itself is, is nice, but uh, maybe we can do more. And if you actually consider how real PCB boards look like, they don't just have one hole size, they have many hole sizes, typically. And uh, historically, what that has meant is that you first process the entire panel with one optical spot size, and then you have to uh, macroscopically change your, your beam path. Either you add a beam expander, or you move a zoom beam expander, or you add a stage to let the beam expand further or less, less far up to the scan lens to create a different optical spot size on the work surface. And then you process the panel again and again and again, depending on just how many uh, different uh, via sizes you need. And that creates a lot of overhead. So the question is, can we avoid that need for a multi-pass process um, somehow to, uh, again, to cut down overhead and move faster? And given that I'm talking here to you today, is the answer is obviously yes. And the, the key idea that we had, again, looking at the, this model of how this uh, hole formation actually works is uh, we realized that our acoustic reflectors naturally give us that 
that bandwidth of you know a megahertz, so a characteristic time scale of a microsecond, which is on the same time scale as the uh, the, the copper uh, uh, removal of your via. So we can actually drag down uh, our beam across the uh, work surface and basically draw out the via size that we want, and the copper ejection will, will follow that. Now this is impossible to do with the gavel because the gavel is far too slow. But uh, doing this, this first model, you can see that we're actually not getting around via. We have this, this cardioid shape, and uh, the first V has actually uh, bared that out, that indeed you have this, this little uh, kink here. And this kink is actually important. So uh, the, the PCB houses have a, a great desire to have pristine round vias to uh, have a proper yield of the plating process. So this is, this is unacceptable. Um, but, uh, well, again, we can, we can model whatever we want. So we ask ourselves as well, what is happening when we, when we move faster, much faster? So here are 120 meters per second. And now you can see that we actually move in sufficiently fast that the thermal diffusion is sufficiently symmetric that we get a, a, not an ejection that follows the uh, optical spot, but is actually naturally happening in the center of the average motion of our optical spot size. And with that, we get a nice round beam. And that, again, is borne out by experiment. Um, and so, yes, you can still get to these kinds of uh, speeds with an optic deflector. So uh, with that, uh, with this ultra-fast beam steering, we now were able to, uh, to have a new process approach where we can process the entire panel in, in one go and cut out all the overhead. And so even though the individual uh, drill time is not necessarily impacted by that, that's another story, um, we can just move faster from via to via through AODs, and we can uh, cut out the overhead by just processing the entire panel at, uh, at all. So uh, today we looked at how modern laser beam positioning works and how we push those uh, from stages only to step and repeat of stages and gamos to infinite field of view processing and finally to the highest ba bandwidth beam steering available today, which is our tertiary beam position with the acoustic defectors. Uh, we also had a very brief first look at understanding the dynamics of laser material interaction quantitatively through uh, hydrodynamic modeling and combining the insights gained from, from the letter uh, with the former, uh, enabled us to move from the traditional multi-pass process of high-density interconnect rigid printed circuit board via drilling to a single-pass process. And so that's one of the key ideas behind our new geo HDI via drilling tool. 